someone made a Mount Rushmore of dispensationalists, Charles Ryrie's face would most certainly be etched onto that mountain. Growing up, the Charles Ryrie Study Bible was the most foundational commentary for me in my initial study of the Bible. I only wish I hadn't gone off track from Ryrie's teachings uh, for about 15 years in my life, but I'm glad to be back and to seeing the same view of the gospel as Charles Ryrie and also to be following along behind him in his views on dispensation. I recently reread Ryrie's Dispensationalism for the third time since reading it for the first time as required reading for a class in Bible college. And it was good to be back under the teaching of a man of God who is skilled in his understanding and clear explanations of the scripture. I read the 2007 Revised and Expanded Edition, which I think is basically the same as the 95 edition that I got in school. Ryrie thrives in this book in his simple and basic writing style. No one could read through dispensationalism and not fully understand what dispensationalism teaches and why dispensationalists believe what they believe. This should be required reading. For all those who desire to cut down dispensationalism and mock its adherence so they can know what dispensationalism actually teaches before they tear it down. Ryrie does a wonderful job showing that dispensationalism is far more than an eschatological system that produced the left-behind books and movies. Whenever someone belittles dispensationalism as equating it with the left-behind books and movies, they don't really know dispensationalism. The middle chapters of the book, chapters 5 through 7, are easily the most important part of this book. These chapters are really all three chapters on hermeneutics, or the basics of biblical inter interpretation in dispensationalism. So this is about how dispensationalists interpret the Bible. Ryrie shows that a dispensationalist is just seeking the plain, normal understanding of each passage. We are not literalists, but we are seeking what the author intended to communicate to his original audience. And we believe that once someone accepts the author's intention for each passage throughout the Bible, the result will be a dispensationalist framework. Ryrie's application of this hermeneutical principle to salvation and then to the church were both so important to show that most of the attacks on dispensationalism are nothing more than straw men and they don't go after the strength of this system. We don't hold to two or more salvations based on the various dispensations. We hold to a consistent contextual definition of Israel, the church, Jerusalem, and more. My favorite quote in the book was the following. The dispensationalist answer to the question of the relation of grace and law is this. The basis of salvation in every age is the death of Christ. The requirement of salvation in every age is faith. The object of faith in every age is God. The content of faith changes in various dispensations. Ryrie shows how dispensationalism is always pointing to the glory of God in every age in history, be it the age of promise or the age of grace or the age of law. The different dispensations don't change salvation. They don't change the purposes of God. What they are simply a change of is in God's management or administration over creation. And I want to say this was widely recognized by many church fathers, even the one most proudly and widely proclaimed by covenant theologians, that is Augustine. Now, I got to say that the one weakness in the book is that I wish Ryrie would have been a little bit more laser focused on just talking about the benefits and the positives of dispensationalism without spending so much time going after those who attack dispensationalists. I would have preferred at times for Ryrie to just forget about those people who had torn down dispensationalism over the years, remain positive about proclaiming how dispensationalism provides tools for people to better interpret the scripture instead of going after the attackers of his cherished theology. 
Now, I don't say this is too big of a knock because I can understand why Ryrie felt the way that he does. I mean, if you are a dispensationalist amongst a large group of pastors or theologians, most often you're going to get mocked, you're going to get belittled for believing a theological view that they think is just ridiculous or wrong. Overall, this is the go-to book in order to understand dispensationalism. Ryrie thoroughly answers the questions, what is dispensationalism? How many dispensations are there? Is dispensationalism really new? And I think the book is worth the cost of admission just to see how dispensationalism is older than J.N. Darby. In my opinion, Isaac Watt should be seen as the grandfather of dispensationalism. And if you want to know why, read Ryrie's book. So I highly recommend Dispensationalism by Charles Ryrie. And for those old school dispensationalists who you've read this before, you got an earlier edition than even the 95 edition sitting on your bookshelf and you haven't looked at it in 20 or 30 years, I would encourage you to go back and read through it again because I think that you would really enjoy it. If you enjoyed this video and this book review, I'd encourage you to press the like button on it in order to help spread out the reach of this video even farther and also subscribe to the Rev Reads YouTube channel in order to stay engaged in the wonderful world of Christian literature.